Hi, everybody. Welcome to this uh, episode of the podcast, Presentation Hell, broadcasting, podcasting here. I do that all the time, podcasting here from Tampa, Florida and Embark Collective. Today, I'm here with Richard Newman, who is the CEO and founder of Body Talk. Hi, Richard. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good. Thanks, James. Well, I'm glad you came on today because like, you know, the, everyone's all over the place and I was, got your email and I was like, you know, you're in the same ballpark I am. This is presentation hell. This is our podcast. I've spent my life in presentations and you're in a similar place. Tell us a little bit about Body Talk. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, so I've been running Body Talk now for 23 years and we coach people on communication all the way around the world. And it, it really just started as a hobby. Uh, it was something where I, I'd been fascinated with body language. Uh, I'd studied acting. I'd been uh, teaching English uh, overseas. I, I lived with Tibetan monks for a period of time where I was uh, teaching English just through body language. We didn't have any uh, words to communicate. And then my, uh, my hairdresser said, well, this is fascinating. Why don't you uh, teach my hairdressers? I'll give you a free haircut if you can teach them communication. And so I did, and they liked it. And I kept on doing it, and eventually I got this phone call uh, from this guy who was the head of an engineering company, and he said, I've just had my hair cut today, and my hairdresser says, you're this coach, can you come and coach my company? And I got up a website, and uh, I've been running the company since. We're now about 20 people. We get about 2,000 bookings per year to come and train people all the way around the world, and now yeah. do the virtual training as well. I guess the lesson learned is, is the talk at the hairdresser might be the most valuable uh, business <laughs> investment you make. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I always say to people, you know, if other people see something in you that you can't see for yourself, then see if you can rise to the challenge. Because at first, when he said, I see this in you, I said to him, you've got to be kidding. I have no idea to do what you're asking me to do. He said, no, you'll figure it out. And, uh, you know, I coach people on that today, that if someone sees, I call it seeing your greatness. The greatest gift mm -hmm. you can give to anybody is to see their greatness, see something in them that they don't see for themselves and help them. Uh, lift themselves to that level. So uh, I'm so pleased that he did that for me. Well, that's excellent. And it's actually a good point because the way people view you is the way they they judge you, the way they make their judge their opinions of you and, and take it away. And if they see you as as a, a great waiter or something, then maybe that's what you are. Or maybe they see you as a great orator or in your case, it was someone who communicates with uh, less verbal and more action that way, more, uh, you know, physical. Yeah, I guess so. Actually, so I was going to say, of, uh, I was gonna say uh, <laughs> I had a conversation with my son recently, my eight year old son, and I was just telling him a story. And he said, Daddy, I really like your stories. You should uh, you should do this for a living. I said, what do you mean? He said, tell stories and, you know, make people laugh. And I said, that is what I do. He said, no, 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 but you could like, you could be funny and stuff. And I said, well, I try and do that too. <laughs> he was sort of naming what I do, but in a different way. He recognized that he just didn't realize that's what put the food on the table. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so no, but he saw you in that, you know, when I think about uh, gestures and movements and things like that, and I come from corporate presentation, business to business sales, doing slide libraries where people are moving ahead. And I noticed some of your principles are similar to the ones we use where you bring someone over with emotion and you, you, you set up the situation, then you follow up with logic and reason, which actually people reinforce their belief of what they made in the first part there. And tell me a little bit about that because you were talking about that, you, you called it survival and emotion which leads into logic and tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So if you think about, uh, I, I ask people this question a lot recently. I say, uh, has anyone, you know, come across the idea of screen fatigue where over the last few years, we've all done this virtual working. We spent more time in front of screens and laptops. And I, I say to an audience, have you come across screen fatigue? Anybody heard it? Anybody felt it? And everybody says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that. And uh, I say to them, are there some people that you know who complain about having screen fatigue and they get to the end of like a Friday afternoon, they close down their laptop because they can't bear to spend time in front of another screen and they go into their living room and they watch Netflix for three hours? <laughs> like, how is that screen <laughs> fatigue? It, it, it's not actually screen fatigue. What we're getting at work is data fatigue. Because what, what happens is when people do a presentation or they communicate in a meeting, they're going straight to the logical part of your brain. And they're talking mm -hmm. about numbers and, and data and KPIs and bullet points. 
And we come out of those meetings and we need two cups of coffee to get over the cognitive fatigue to go into the next meeting, which is all about the logic stuff, which, which wears mm -hmm. us down. And then we switch that off because we can't bear it anymore. What do we do? We go and watch a story. And the reason being, the reason that we can binge watch seven seasons of Game of Thrones over a weekend and not get screen fatigue is that stories are engaging our brain in the way that our brain wants to receive information. So the three mm -hmm. core areas of the brain that wants to receive information, as I'm sure you'll well know, is the survival part of the mind, then the emotional part of the mind, and then the logical mind. And if you engage those three areas in that order, which is the order the brain really evolved in, then you compel the brain to listen. And so, uh, so I always say to people, you know, first of all, you've got to make sure when you go to a team meeting, when you go and speak at a conference, if you're doing a pitch, for a client, you've got to make sure you engage that survival part of the mind. What, what are the cha challenges they're dealing with right now? What concerns they have, what, is what issues? The, what are you yeah, the, the survival part is about the challenges you're talking about, the challenges that they're facing at that point. So you should try to articulate the problems that they're having before you engage the emotion. Exactly. So th this could be things that you think are keeping those people awake at night, or there's also another way to approach it, where sometimes you might need to engage people where they think everything is fine. And you can say to them, you know how you think everything is fine right now? Have you considered that six months from now, if we don't act on this, we're going to be in a really bad place? And then the survival mind is engaging, thinking there is a f there's fear of something up ahead. And so it's fear of a negative future. So you can engage that part then you engage the emotional mind and talk about how things could be much better. Talk about things that people want to have. Uh, get, get the joy going for them in that story, in that information. And then finally, you deliver your spreadsheet. Finally, you deliver your information, which is the payoff of everything you've been saying so far. And then people are utterly engaged. And when they, when they leave the meeting, they're more likely to remember your information because you engage the mind in the way that it wants to be engaged. So, so that's sort of key to, uh, to telling, using storytelling to tell your information in business. No, I, I like the survival component. I, as you were speaking, I kind of made reference to a half a dozen political things that have happened in the past few years where you were, you were told about catastrophe and then you were told that you're going to lo lose your loved one. And then your, your solution is to do X, Y, and Z, stay in your home and don't do all that stuff. And whether it's right or wrong, the technique that was used to bring everyone along was very much the same of what you, what you just laid out. Yeah, you can see this used in the media, used by politicians, used by large corporations all the time. Yeah. So I always say, like, I want to level the playing field and give this strategy to everyone so that you can influence your, your friends, your family, your community, your business, your clients mm -hmm. in a positive way by understanding this is what other people are doing maybe negatively. You can do it for a positive reason to move things in the right direction. It's almost like a structure for storytelling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, th this is the key also, is to understand this structure. So this is, uh, you know, coming from back in the 1950s, there was a guy called Joseph Campbell who was a mythologist yeah. who was studying the structure of stories. And uh, he, he looked at the, the way st the stories have been structured by different civilizations around the planet. What was fascinating, he studied people who had never interacted. So he looked at the, the tablets of Gilgamesh that was the first re record of a story we've, we've ever got. And he realized the structure there was exactly the same structure of stories that was being used thousands of years later by Shakespeare. But we didn't mm -hmm. discover the tablets of Gilgamesh until after Shakespeare had died. And so there was this structure of storytelling that was being used by great storytellers around the world. But nobody knew what it was until he pinned it down. And so what we aim to teach people you know, day to day is a, a refined version of that. Because sometimes people try and put the whole uh, hero's journey that he created into action. Oh, yeah, There's yeah. 17 stages in it. And it's, you, you can't do that in, in the average presentation. I mean, the only way you can, the way I've been able to communicate the hero's story, the best way, for me, I tell him the story of Tr Shrek. <laughs> right. yeah. And almost every scene hits the 17 scenes in a row. And everyone has an image of, oh yeah, remember when he came to the swamp and he tried throwing every, every he tried to avoid the 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 challenge and threw everyone out. And obviously that's the first part of it. The challenge hits him and he's like, no, I don't want it. And then it comes back and it, and then there's an emotional moment and they go in. So it makes a lot of sense that way. Yeah. Yeah. What exactly. Is, is go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say. So so I mean, you know, people love that that whole sort of piece. And if you're writing a story, writing a fictional story, even writing a, uh, you know, a business book, you can follow those stages. 
But what I found is when I tried to teach this for people who have got like a, a five minute talk or a 20 minute TED talk or something, they can't go through the denial of the quest and the belly of the whale and so they just haven't got the yeah. time. So we refined it based around survival, emotional logic and then next steps. And, and once you do that piece, you realize you can see that in so many different stories like Star Wars and Harry Potter and all the rest of them. Oh yeah, the structure is incredible. Harry Potter is no different than Star Wars. They, they, the kid's cousin was taken away, raised by some other parents, has magical things. They found him. It was a fight to bring him back. When he did, he reclaimed the quest of what his parents left behind. And same story, different scene. <laughs> Homer isn't far from that. So let's take this little different area of white right here. We're talking, you know, about communication and gestures and the way you speak. And we're talking about business and everything. How does this affect relationships? Uh, so uh, you mean, how, how, do, how do your gestures affect relationships? Well, yeah, like, you know, let's say in a different environment, we're talking about a business environment. I want to convince you that my product is really good and it's going to benefit you. And I want you to take action by giving me an invoice, right? Or give me a purchase order. But in, in real life, we meet people and we want to engage them. We want to be friends with them. You might even, you might, might even want a romantic relationship with them. Are, is there a way this structure can help in these different environments that can make my life a little better and easier and, and know that I'm confidently going in there and I'm not, you know, sweating when I shouldn't be? Yeah, so, so this is something we've talked to people a lot about over the last few years because we found that since the pandemic hit and people were spending more time at home, uh, they have uh, maybe moved to a new business, maybe even spent most of their time working at home, never being in the workplace, never being around, uh, you know, having a coffee break or around the water cooler with each other. And so a lot of our clients have said they've just lost that deeper connection, that deeper relationship at work. And also people are struggling more with communication skills outside of work because we're just generally spending more time in our homes and less time socializing uh, with others. And so when I ask audiences, and I say this, I, are you having more superficial conversations or superficial relationships? It's, does it feel more transactional these days? Then the vast majority say, yes, that's where we are. So I talked to them about reversing the story structure. So the story structure being survival, emotional, logical. And then I say to them, okay, so let's start off with logic. And I say, you know, look at uh, the conversations that you've had over the past week. Uh, how many of those conversations would you say just were about sort of logic and facts? where maybe you, you, know, you might have sort of uh, met someone at um, a, a coffee shop where you're buying a cup of coffee or you've engaged with someone at a hotel or you spoke to someone at the reception desk where you're working, you spoke to somebody who you live with, who, you, who lives in your house. How did a factual transaction, like I, I gave you money for, for a cup of coffee or just a, just a basic transaction that is just straight up simplistic? Yeah, so, so it could be a financial transaction. And sometimes it's an information transaction where you say okay. to someone, how was your day? It was good. Did you do your maths homework? Yes, I did. Um, you know, uh, did you manage to catch the bus on time? Yes, I did. And it just feels transactional. And so this is what people like are, are doing kids. in a lot of their relationships. <laughs> I said it's like talking to your kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, 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 so many people are there and they're just not going any deeper. So I say, okay, well, it's all right to hit the logical part of a conversation. Sometimes if you've just met someone, that's the place that you start. You start with familiar territory. You know, what do I know that you also know? And that's okay. But then you need to move into the emotional part of the conversation, which is where uh, if someone's good friends with you or if you build up a deeper relationship with someone, that's often where they start. How are you feeling today? You know, what, what are your thoughts on this? What, what's your opinion? on that uh you know how it's easier to flow into that type of thing when you have a relationship with someone i can go up to my friend and be like i could half insult them or somewhat you know make it open that way but there's a lot of environments that you're just not comfortable yet and could you give some advice on how to ease that you know people are listening they want to know more about this type of thing but how to ease into that a little better because you know, we're all home. I'm talking into a computer for crying out loud. And you know what I mean? It's like all alone with everyone home. You know, you don't know what's going on. Everyone's here. You're in your device. You're with this world and the ether and you're not really engaging. Any advice on how to how to change it from the great, you know, the, the weather's great today to you really don't feel well. And, and, you know, let's go out and have a beer tonight. Yeah. So, so it's a sense of, a sense of if you imagine that you're 
digging for buried treasure. This is what I talk about with uh, you know, building deeper relationships. The treasure is right at the bottom of the hole, and you've got to dig all the way down. You can't start at the bottom. You've got to dig at the surface, and then you've got to gradually dig further. And so you can be speaking to someone who you've never met before, and you've got nothing in common with at this stage. And you just ask them the transactional sort of questions along the lines of, um, hey, do you know uh, what the weather's going to be like tomorrow? Or, um, hey, did you see that game yesterday? And so you're just asking simple questions they can easily answer. Or you might say, hey, I, I noticed the questions you answered. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. the questions you asked weren't single response questions. They were eliciting some sort of more emotional said, what did you feel about the game yesterday? You didn't say who won. You know what I mean? Like that's a very definitive answer when you say, you know, when you brought you brought up really opening questions, open ended type questions, which was interesting. Yeah, so, so the key, though, is, is you have to start with the transactional piece. Like, just start there so the person looks at you and thinks, okay, this person's okay. I've answered a couple of questions. They were easy. Because if you go up to somebody who you haven't met before and you say, how do you feel about politics in the U.S. at the moment? They're like, what? Hang on a second. Who are you? Are you taking the ball? Where's the hidden camera? Like, so they're not going to be happy. But if you, if you start off with a transactional question, they'll think, okay, I trust you. I like you. You haven't stabbed me yet. But this is all right. This is okay. And then you can go down to, and yeah, how did you feel about it? Like, how did you feel about the last episode of Ted Lasso? Like, what was that like for you? Because you've, you've already asked them a couple of questions, and then you, you go down one level to the feeling level, and you can do this with your boss, a client, or you can do this with someone who you're getting to know. And when you go down to the feeling level, just notice, do they come with you? Or are they staying at the transactional level? Because some people don't want to open up to you, and they'll give you a transactional answer. If you say, you know, how, how did you feel about the game in last night? <clears throat> Yeah, they, they, they'll go back and they'll just give you a dry answer. You think, okay, well, I need to do a bit more work building the rapport. So it's, it's like it's stairs in a way. You're taking steps. You're, you're doing the first informational, transactional, and then you want to move to more of an emotive type situation where you're gathering something from how they feel or how they interpreted something or what their value or position on. And when you've opened that up and you've actually have someone that you're now – connecting on a more human level, which is more emotional. What's the next step? So the next step uh, to go to, which you don't have to go to, but if you want to really understand someone that you work with, someone who you might want to have a relationship, someone in your family as well, is that you need to get down to the survival level. So you've done the logical level, the emotional level. You've got to get down to survival level. And at that point, you're really asking questions along the lines of what is the most important thing? to them about this subject. Whatever subject you've been talking about, what is most important for them? What is most significant for them? What is the main reason that they are choosing to do what they're doing right now? What was the most significant thing that's driving their behavior? And you, do, you have to earn it. Like I say, this is buried treasure. You start off transactional, surface level, easy questions to answer. Then you go down to the emotional level, and then you go down. And this is what great chat show hosts will do, too. Like, hey, how was your journey here? Was it okay? I heard you caught the plane, then there was a bit of a delay, and so on. And did you get in all right? Did my team treat you okay? Tell me how you mm -hmm. feel about your show right now. Now, what's really important to you in your career? What, what's the biggest thing that's standing out for you? And they'll do this, and they've managed to get this amazing conversation because they're, they're going down those three levels, logic, then feeling, then into that driving piece. And mm -hmm. you've really got to earn it. You can't dive in there straight away. I remember learning this a long time ago where uh, I was talking to a friend and then somebody new walked in we're at like a party and this new person walked up to us and I just turned to her and I said, um, yeah, what, what do you think about God and spirituality? And she's like, hello, I don't even know who you are. Like, what you, where did this question come from? It was a natural progression of our conversation, but she just joined. So she hadn't gone through all the layers that we got to, to that point. So you've got to make sure that you're earning your way there uh, gradually to, to find out how people are going. The, the one caveat I give for people, the most important thing to remember, is not to ask a why question. When you ask a question beginning with why, then people can get very defensive. Uh, the reason being, everybody, when we were like four years old, we picked up something in the kitchen, we smashed it on the kitchen floor, and a parent or guardian rushed over to us and said, why did you do this? And so we get defensive about the word why. So instead you can say, you know, what's important to you, what's the most significant thing, rather than using that word why, which can put the, uh, the shutters down on the conversation. Well, the word why also makes you give your actual position on something. It forces you to take a position, and a lot of people don't like to be like, why did this happen? You're like, 
the door was left open. It, it leads to something that is is with some sort of uh, accountability, which a lot of people, you know, try to avoid on that. That's very interesting. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say one of the key things people don't like about it, too, is that when they justify their actions about most things, people will give you a logical answer, but that's not why they did it. We, we make decisions based on emotion. We justify them with logic. When you say, why did you do that? They say, well, because the KPI on the spreadsheet said 17.7%. That's why I did it. It's, it's a logical decision. The reason they really did it is because they like the salesperson. That's the, the honest answer, but they can't, they can't say that. So they say, well, it was 17.7%. No, that makes total sense. The interesting thing here is that like when you were speaking about convincing someone in the very beginning about business situation, it was survival, emotion, logic. And when you started going into the personal relationship, it flipped it over logic, emotion, survival to make the connection that way. And I just, just you know, just kind of interesting that that type of uh, situation happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you, you've got to engage all three areas of the mind to have a compelling conversation with somebody, but it's just a matter yeah. of choosing the right situation for where you approach it. All right. Well, let me ask you about your new book. You have it coming out. It's called Lift Your Impact. And uh, it's it's about mindset, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, look at that. See, give it, put it up a little higher so everyone can see it so they know what it's looking like. There you go. Dead center. Okay. So what's what's the theme? How what are the benefits a reader is going to get from from reading your book? I have some notes here of, of it, but let's hear it in your words. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I've been running training events now for 23 years and at the beginning of 2020, uh, all of our events got canceled. All of our events pre 2020 were in person. We were uh, traveling all over the world. Everything got shut down. And so I started to ask clients, what do you really need right now? It, like if we can serve you in some way, what do you need? And what we realized is over these last couple of years is that there's been three major things that have been standing out. So firstly, people have been feeling a lot more stressed. And so there's been many more people leaving the workplace because of stress or taking days off because of stress. And part of that is because lots of pressures were put on them to maintain certain targets when they are having to work from home and share the broadband with their teenagers and homeschool their ki children and get their cat off their keyboard while they're doing a client meeting. All sorts of levels of stress that have come up, plus inflation, there's a war going on, there's challenges in politics, and people are feeling deeply stressed. The second major challenge people said they had is people feeling lonely. Like, even if they are told, you have to now go back to the office five days a week. Hence what I said earlier, all alone with everyone home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so people are just feeling like I, I don't feel connected with other people now and that people are less amicable with each other. They have less strong relationships. And the third thing that stood out for people is uh, just a sense of a lack of purpose. There's been the great resignation uh, and people not heading back to the workplace, wanting to do something else and other people staying in the workplace and just feeling like I don't even know why, what I, why, why I'm here. What am I doing this for? And so I built the book around those three elements. So first of all, dealing with stress by giving people a, a really strong mindset so they can be a rock in the storm no matter what is going on around them. They're very clear on who they are and who they want to be, what direction they want to take their life in. Then the second piece of the book is, well, when you know who you are and what you want to do, you've got to then influence and engage with other people because otherwise you can't get very far. So that's all about the science of communication, of how do you deeply connect with people, influence them through your body language, storytelling, and other pieces. And then the third part of the book is once you've done that, how do you keep going long term and have a really compelling legacy? Because I see so many people, they make New Year's resolutions, they've given up by the 5th of January, and people just get stuck and they, they don't get as far as they mm -hmm. want in their goals. So how do you make sure you truly keep momentum towards the future you, that you desire? And all of it backed up by science. So that's what Lift Your Impact is really about, making sure that people are thriving, they're feeling good, they're able to have great interactions and a compelling future. I have to tell you what you just told me sounds like my experience in the past three years. I feel like I lived through that. I've articulated each one of those steps along the way. And I'm, uh, you know, we're on this podcast. I'm, I'm 50 episodes in. Uh, not only that, we wrote a book and I felt that at the end of COVID, the, the loneliness, the lack of purpose and direction and reset everything going. So I can, as a personal person, without reading your book, but what you just said, I lived through each one of those stages and they're really powerful. And if anyone listening 
is uh, considering some of these issues. These are good points that that make a, made a big difference in my life. So I'm thanking you for something you've already done, and I haven't even read it. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, and you know, obviously, uh, I empathise with you that you've been through those things. Everybody that I've been speaking to says those are the big three they, that they needed some support with. So, yeah, I designed this book like a workbook so that people can imagine I'm coaching them through it. And they're sort of making notes as they go through the pages just to, to overcome those areas because I'm really keen to to lift people. You know, give everybody needs a lift at the moment, and that's the uh, the aim of the book. And you can get this on Amazon, I assume. Yes, it's available everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Books A Million, uh, all, all good places, yeah. Very good. Anywhere you'd like to get good information. Now, I will say, normally on, the, on our podcast here, I go into details of presentations and moments of people's life, whether, you know, kind of communicate. But uh, Richard had such depth of knowledge of the understanding, I just let him keep going because he gave better knowledge than trying to find someone's problem. <laughs> So I thank you for that. And um, so thank you, Richard, for coming on. We're going to wrap up. Is there anything you'd like to say to the crowd before we uh, say goodbye? Sure, yeah. If, if anyone wants to get a sample of my book, uh, I decided I wanted to give the first 25 pages away for free. Uh, so if people go to Lift oh, Your Impact. Okay dot com uh, forward slash the book liftyourimpact.com forward slash the book you scroll down to the bottom of the page there's loads of informa information but at the bottom you can just tick a box that says send me the first 25 pages and that sends you the, the introduction to the book which gets you into your your values your purpose and sending you in the right direction so uh, people are welcome to go there that's excellent thank you richard richard founder and ceo of uh, body talk and author of Lift Your Impact, and uh, you can visit his website and actually get a first few, view, few uh, 26 pages of it. Thank you for coming on Presentation Hell, and thank you all for listening. Thanks very much.